hands and many back, but God, give us the strength to keep working for you. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, Jesus. And let your perfect will be done in our life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Could you all shout a praise? Hallelujah. 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 One more time, I shout a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to sing another song, but you may be seated. Amen. It says, in the book of God so precious, we are told of Pentecost. Yes. Oh, yes. Starry for the Holy Ghost. Pentecost can be Glory, glory be his precious. You have your hand. Clap, clap. Pentecostal fire is falling. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It fell on me. Put, yes. Pentecostal fire is falling. Brother, let it. You're you, you, you letting me. Oh, in the book. Yeah. Pentecost can be repeated, for the Lord is just the same. Come on. Yesterday, today, forever. Glory to his precious name. Saints of God can be victorious over sin and death and hell. And have a full and free salvation. And the blessed story tell. Sing with me. Pentecostal fire is falling. Praise the Lord, it fell on me. Pentecostal fire is falling. Brother, let it fall on. Verse 3. When the church of Jesus tarries. Pentecostal fire with fall. Hallelujah. Sin and wrong will be defeated. Sinners on the Lord will call. She will march a glorious victory over every land and sea. And lifting high the blood stained banner. Holiness, her motto be. Yes, Pentecostal fire is falling. Praise the Lord, it fell on me. A Pentecostal fire is falling. Brother, let it fall on me. So we we'll sing the power. The the purity, the power, the power, the power over Penty. One more time, oh, the power, the power. Yes, and purity within, the power, the power. One more time. Oh, the power, the power. Yes, and purity within. The power, the power. One more time. I say the power, the power. Woo! The power of a Pentecost. Oh, the power. Amen. The power. Can you shout a hallelujah? Amen. Just one more song. Amen. And I want us to stand and we're going to sing and we're going to magnify. You, anybody know what tomorrow will bring? You know if you're going to live to see tomorrow? Who, who knows they are going to live to see tomorrow? You know you're going to live to see tomorrow? So while we have the opportunity to worship God and give God the praise, we want to do that, right? Amen. 
I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. I've got a feeling that everything is gonna be all right. Oh, yes, I've got a feeling that everything is gonna be all right. Be all right. Be all right. See it again. Yeah. I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Yeah, I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Yes, and I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Be all right, be all right, be all right. Why? Listen now. Yes, Jesus told me that everything is going to be all right. Oh, Jesus told me that everything is going to be all right. Yeah, Jesus told me that everything is going to be be all right, be all right, be all right. One more time, Jesus told me. Come on, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah! <laughs> Amen. 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 I'd like to read in your hearing. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. I think this is one, this is one of my favorite um, verse, especially when, it, when the context is in working for the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. It says, and whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And he gave the reason to us. He says, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Read it again. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray. Pray for this Congress. That the Lord will just take full control. Amen? Amen. Dear God, we give you thanks for who you are. Thank you for orchestrating such a moment like this where we can sit and learn and be inspired and motivated to work for you there's nothing better to do than to live our life that is holy and pleasing and the next thing is to work for you with everything that we have lord only what we do for you have any lasting value I pray for every one of us here, all the pastors and, and ministers of Region 1 and, and workers, mission workers and workers generally, hallelujah, that we will all work for you like never before with one common cause, that your kingdom will be advanced. You're the only superstar, and we just want to proclaim your name, not our name, but your name. Take full control of all the presenters. And those that are on their way, we pray you protect them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And could the church say amen? Amen. God bless you. Amen. I know, hand over to our presbyter, Reverend King. That's low. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. I was getting out of the car. Praise God. When at 5.30, we didn't see anybody. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. The Lord is good. All the time, the Lord is good. Amen. I want to welcome everyone to our Region 1 Congress. Amen. I know it's a little different from the most of our Congresses have been on Zoom, but I'm not really a Zoomer. <laughs> I'm not really a Zoomer. I just can't get used to the Zoom thing, you know? I'm not saying it's anything is wrong with Zoom, but to each his own. Each of us have our different preferences and our unique personalities, and the Lord understand that. And we, we try to bring that uniqueness to bear on our ministry and our involvement in the kingdom. Amen? And I think the Lord understand that. I know there are pastors who are still struggling with the current time because of the challenges that they face, especially as it relates to the technology and their view of it. Amen? And there are some who are to the far left. There are some who are to the far right. And there are some who are evolving into it. Amen? I remember we started having prayer meeting on Zoom. And at first, I was a little apprehensive. But when we started having the prayer meeting, I remember we were sitting, my wife, myself, and my son, we were sitting there. And there was such an awesome, I'm telling you, there was such an awesome presence of God in the place. Amen. And it feel like the awesome presence of God was everywhere that And there's a lot of new things emerging. There are persons who want to conduct their, their baby. And we don't have time to maybe go into all of these views, but there are individuals who want to conduct their baby dedication online. Yes, they want us online dedication. So we would bring them up on the screen or wherever, and then we dedicate them from the church, but they want to do it online. Sir. 
No, that is new. I just heard of that. It's not in the protocol. But it's something that pers persons are asking for. Um, so you need to shape your views on that. Is that okay? And I, in, in one case, it's somebody all the way from Canada. They said they are in a deep rural area of Canada where no churches, none of their type of church. Because I've known of persons who have migrated to universities and so on, and where they live, there's no Pentecostal church within miles. And these persons sometimes log into our online portal and they want that type of a support. Amen. And we'll be looking at that later. The Elba team looking at how to, how to create and, and minister to our online congregation. So you have, you have members in Africa and Europe and China, but you are their pastor. I had a rude awakening a couple of months ago. I was at church. And one of the young ladies came to me and said she yesterday she had a discussion with her online pastor. And she was talking about this online pastor in a very passionate way. And they said they have been interacting and they have been counseling her on a matter. And she has an online pastor. So the world is going down different routes. So what do we do as a movement, you know, as an organization? What is your view on an online congregation? So th there's this booklet. The protocols are there. That was the vision at the time. And someone even asked us to marry them online, asked if I could marry them online. I tell them I don't know the legality of marrying them online, if that is possible. I don't know. <laughs> they want us to perform the ceremony online. I told them I'm not sure if we can do it. But it's something we have to look at. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's possible to do, do an online wedding. That is something we have to look at also. Right, so that is where we are at. Trying to do a present, set up a present. I'll be doing a, the first presentation called Boots on the Ground. Boots on the Ground. Um, praise God. All right, I just want to make sure yeah, the slide is up. First century evangelism model, boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. I believe, I'm convinced, while the online portals such as Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, is an excellent tool for our members to interact Amen, to provide training and development and for members to socialize, interact, and communicate. I don't believe it is an effective tool for evangelism and lead, reaching our communities. And I want to say that. Because it, when I go on the online portals, I don't see any people. There are people from all over the world, but if your church is, say, here, I don't see anybody from Jerusalem or, you know, over across the road or boulevard on it. I'm not reaching my community. I'm reaching people, the uttermost part of the earth I'm reaching, but I'm not reaching my neighborhood. So I don't think the church can abandon its responsibility to reach the neighborhood because we are the lighthouse in the community. I, I just think we have a responsibility to reach our community. All right? So, Boots on the Ground is a proposal that Region 1 is putting forward to, to bridge that gap between the online, uh, 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 what do you call it now, uh, hybrid approach. You have your online portals, and Boots on the Ground intention is to complement the online portal but at the same time, reaching our community. I remember when we were down to eight or 10 members, we still had service. I remember almost every Sunday I was here, there's 10 of us who we weren't streaming, people coming out of the street. I remember one lady came in off the street one day. Every, almost every Sunday, someone came in off the street and we had to pray for them and assist them. So we cannot close the lighthouse. The Bible said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he shall, that word is shall, be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, 
And I did a research recently about Jerusalem. Is Judea, Judea was 30 kilometers or something like that from Jerusalem. And when I did my check, it takes us all the way to about Linstead. All the way to Linstead. It takes us all the way to the border of St. Mary up in Lawrence, up in Tom's Riverside. It takes us all the way to St. Thomas. Almost to, to that St. Thomas area. The border of St. Thomas into St. Thomas and the, cover the whole of Portmore. All of that region, that circular is our Jerusalem that we have a responsibility to reach with the gospel. And then after we finish with Jerusalem and Judea, we go to Judah, amen, and then we go to Samaria. And after we finish that, we are supposed to go to the uttermost part of the earth. It's such a strategic approach to evangelism and reaching our communities. But if you look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8, that's what the Lord told them to do. But they did not do it. All of them pack up in Jerusalem and refused to leave. The Lord gave them a command, you know, say. But all of them pack up in Jerusalem and decide, we are not leaving Jerusalem. And look at what happened. If you turn Acts chapter 8, 1 verse 8, turn it around, you get Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And it said, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad. Throughout the regions of what? Judea and Samaria, except the apostle. And that is significant. So they didn't want to do it, so the Lord sensed persecution, and him just scattered them. They didn't have a choice, they had to run. And he scattered them throughout all Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles were still in Jerusalem. But all the other members of the church were scattered. Amen. And the vote man carried Stephen to his burial. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering the house and ailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, verse 4 is instructive. Therefore, they that were what? Scattered abroad, went what? Everywhere. And what did they do? They preached the gospel everywhere. So whether they were on Facebook, they were preaching on Facebook, they were on Twitter. Wherever they went and scattered, they preached the gospel. This was not the apostle now. This was the ordinary member of the church that were scattered. They were cultured that way. And then Philip went down to Samaria. The Bible said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great? And it, that great salvation, we're talking about the doctrine of salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect? Not embrace or accept because we have done that. But we cannot neglect that great salvation which at first began to be. Because of time, I'm going to go through quickly. I want to say the church was born in a crisis. The first century church was born in a crisis. So crisis is not new to the apostolic church. Amen. So we, we, we shouldn't get nervous when crisis come. And I think the Bible has the solution to all our problems. It's just that we don't want the solution and we're not looking hard enough. But the church was born in a crisis. And crisis come, when you study the Bible and you, you go through it, Crisis come to always come to realign the people of God with his divine purpose. And if you, you can, and you are ministers of the gospel, and I stand to be corrected, and if you can correct me or talk to me afterwards or whenever to say I don't agree, I, I don't have a problem. We can sit and we can discuss it. But the church was born in a crisis. And I want to say that crisis is not new to the church. And crisis come, whether in our personal life or in the life of the church, is to realign the church with its divine purpose. And we don't have time. Crisis is a tool that the Lord has used throughout human history to realign mankind with his divine purpose. We look at the children of Israel, all the crisis that they had, because the Lord wanted to get them back on track. So if sickness come and hardship and all the things that come, the Lord has a purpose. So the ever member of weakness... God's master plan for evangelism, the strategy is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Proverbs 19, 21, what does it say? Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord purpose that will stand. You know, this year I had great plans. I had plans to buy for region one to to buy tents. I had plans in my head, and I want to buy tents. I want to have four. I was thinking of like having four tent crusade, ten crusade the whole year. 
I'm crazy. I, I was thinking how it's out of strange thoughts. Amen. I wanted to, yes, operation fail and we have all of these plans. But many are the plans in a man's heart. But it is the Lord's purpose that will stand. I believe the apostolic doctrine of salvation has been restored. I have no doubt. I believe we have the doctrine of salvation. But I don't believe, and I, you can take me to task on this. This is a strong personal belief. I don't believe the method of propagating the apostolic doctrine has been restored. I don't believe the method of propagating the apostolic doctrine have been restored. The doctrine has been restored, but the method of propagating that doctrine, I honestly don't believe. I have had doubts about the apostolic doctrine. I have had doubts, even in my adult life, even as a minister. I'm being frank with you. You know why I have, I have had doubts? Not because of the, the churches and the false doctrine out there. I have had doubts about the apostolic doctrine because of our response to it. If I've always said to myself, if what we believe, if we really believe that what we preach and teach is true, then our attitude to it is wrong. If we believe you, the only way to be saved is baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And anybody who don't do this is lost for eternity. Then something is wrong with our atti attitude. And our, we are very nonchalant about it. And I, that has been always been my concern. All right? So, very quickly, everybody was scattered except who? The apostles. You notice that? And I've, I've always believed that the apostles were wholesale evangelists. And the members are the retail evangelists. The difference between the wholesale and the retail. Amen? So I believe the apostles are wholesale evangelists. And the members are retail evangelists. And I'm going to explain that a little further. If you look at 2 Timothy 2 verse 3, it says, Anything that thou hast heard, this is Paul speaking. He said, The things that you have heard of me among many witness so paul is talking to somebody right he's talking to timothy and he said to timothy i have passed on some things to you the same commit now to faithful men so that is three tier paul pastor timothy men like timothy right not just timothy because he told titus a similar thing and there are others he might have told a similar thing so paul passed on to timothy the Timothys. The Timothys find faithful men. These are maybe the, the department heads and the deacons or the leaders in the, in the local assemblies. And then there's another level who will be able to teach others also. So we say four tier of passing on the message. So Paul is saying, I'm going to pass on to you men. Amen. One to, it's like saying one to many. One to many. So it's one to many, then many to many. Right? So, same commit to faithful men who will teach others also. In Titus 1 verse 5, he said the same thing in a different way. For this cause, I, I, I left thee in Crete. So, I'm saying to, he went to, to Crete and he appointed Titus. And he said to him, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. So, I passed it on to Titus and I gave him a message to do what? Set in order the things that are wanting and to ordain elders in every city. So, Paul instruct Titus, pass it on to all the elders in the city that I have a city as I have appointed thee. So, appoint you, Titus. You're now going to appoint elders in all the cities. And then these elders now are going are gonna to pour themselves into the saints. Right? So, it's like a company having salesmen. You have the master salesman. You have the second tier of salesmen. And it goes all the way down to propagate. So, you have like a tree-like structure. That, 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 it's a multiplication structure. And that's what he said. So, this is it. Except the apostles. This is what he said. So, the Lord what? The Lord pour himself into the apostles. The apostles pour themselves into the pastors and elders. The pastor and elder pour themselves into the saints and members. And the members pour themselves into the community. That is the first century model that I detected in the book of Acts. So let's go again. The Lord pour himself into the apostles. The apostles pour themselves into the pastors and elders. The pastors and elders pour themselves into the saints and members. And the members pour themselves into their communities. That is the model. That is the multiplication model. 
So very quickly, the, look at the Jerusalem concept, the church with 100 members. Well, before we get to that, on a Sunday morning in Jerusalem, there wasn't just one little, con there was a one congregation. Study church history in depth. What we had in Jerusalem on a, on a regular worship morning was maybe hundreds of small groups all over Jerusalem. I'm not saying we're going to go to that. I'm just telling you what happened in the first century. There was like hundreds of small group of tributaries all over Jerusalem. In these small groups, you have, if you look at 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you have a what? A Psalms, a doctrine, have a tongue, have a revelation, have an interpretation. Let all things be done decently and in order. So imagine you have 200 small groups around Jerusalem. Each of those small groups would have maybe three or four visitors. Okay, it was a community-based thing and they invite out their neighbors, their friends. So if you multiply that by 200, on a Sunday morning, you end up with thousands of visitors in church. Right? But you had 20 members and everybody, it was a church that was built on participation. So everybody participated. It was not like today at church, which is a concert hall. The pastor and his team is up there. And the average member is just a member of the concert. They come and they watch the program. And, and you, you know, you, it's like a, you, you, you direct them. So when they say sit down, them sit down, them get up, them get up. And as church done, them gone. There is no connection with what is happening. They come for the show. They come to watch. So if, if you don't get the right singer, them vex because you pastor get the money, I'm so boring. Or the right person to sing. Well, she has to sing every Sunday. So they are, they are a part of a concert. Not so in the first century church. Every member was a participant. So when you turn up to church on Sunday morning, you have to bring something. And you have to pray about it. You have to bring a song, a testimony, an interpretation, a psalms. And in that little circle, people participate. The Holy Ghost fall. People get the Holy Ghost. And that happens. All right? So that's how the first century church was organized. I'm saying, in COVID season, COVID had, had brought us, brought us somewhat to that point. Amen? And if, and, and if God is giving us that message, assume, I don't, I, I don't want to speak as a prophet, but if God is giving us that message and we ignore it, then maybe we going to have to do something else for us to get it. His idea of his church, first, that's why the Bible says in, in Jerusalem, in the book of Acts, that they multiplied. So when you hear that 5,000 people get the Holy Ghost, now you can see how it happened. It's not, there, was a, there was a big church with, with 5,000 visitors, and 5,000 people get the Holy Ghost in one building. When the report come in on a Sunday morning from all the little elements, all the little groups around Jerusalem or wherever, thousand, it add up to thousands of people. When the baptism figure come in, you hear that 3,000 were baptized Sunday morning because every group was having their baptism and their conversion. That's how first century church was operating. So, if, for example, in our assembly, say it's Sunday nights, we still are under COVID protocol, etc. Imagine if we could organize, you have, a, you have 100 members, and you could get eight groups, and you make sure they are strategically equipped. You have a preacher in there, you have, you have two good singers, you have different type of person to ensure it goes smooth. And you, you, you plant them at different points around the community, that, 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 Different points around your community that, that maintain social distancing and the COVID protocol. So on a Sunday night, for instance, you'd have what? You'd have eight preachers out there preaching on the corner. And I'm t I promise you, thousands of people be hearing our message. We'll be filling our community with our doctrine. Right? Because what you're going to do, and I'm, I'm not talking about something. For the past five weeks, we have been doing this. Five to six weeks, we have had boots on the ground. As I said, the sign up there. And what we do, like, we go into a community. This is the community. There's a little spot here, like a little play field. But right around us are homes. People in them bedroom, people in them house. You see the kids are play over there, sir. So the rest of them are smoking guns, just play over there, sir. You see some people over there, sir, play domino. You see some lady, that want shop over there, sir, talk. So it's in the community. And you set up in the middle of them, where they're far from you. And you, you teach them the doctrine of salvation. So they know they must repent of their sin. They must baptize in Jesus' name. And they must receive the Holy Ghost. Thousands of people are hearing the message 
We are fulfilling our mandate. We don't have to call an altar call if afraid them come and COVID. We, and we also, remember, can we choose a spot that we can stand even six feet apart? So we are far apart. And we set up a sound box so them loud enough. And we propagate the gospel. A lot of people. And imagine, imagine if 20 churches did that or 10. Split up like that. I'm telling you, thousands on a Sunday night. Not just take five visitors in our church when we're alone in there and nobody. And we feel so happy. Yeah, we turn up at church and 200 of us and two visitors and we feel like we have achieved a great thing. And we have not achieved not, nothing. It's, it's, it's a joke. Right? Because, to, and this is a science meeting to minister to saints. Perfect. But if it's an evangelistic service, then we have a problem. But if something like that, for instance, imagine what's happening on a Sunday night. You'll be ministering to tens of thousands of people. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word will do the work. Amen? Good to have brother minister Neymar with us. Amen? And he said something on Sunday. He, he, he said something that when he went to burn shop, in the early days, nobody wasn't coming to church. Church was empty. That's what you say, right, sir? If, if, I, if I tell anything, you can't come and when, when time comes, you can't come correct me. And he said, but what they did, they infiltrate the community and go all about and teach the word at the corner shop and give it a couple months. And so these same people now start pouring because you plant the seed. We don't, we don't reap in the same season that we sow. You don't expect to plant today and reap tomorrow. So the law of the harvest work. If we don't plant the seed, the next generation won't have nothing to reap. So if we fill region one and fill it with the seed and baptism in Jesus' name, it's the only baptism and we teach them about eternal judgment and all of that. And it's in their mind. And we plant the seed of the word, filling our community. The Lord's COVID, I think, has provided us with an opportunity to do that. First century church was built on participation, involvement, and engagement. Boots on the ground. So like a community location that supports social distancing. All participants wear the mask, ob observe protocol. Participants with the requisite skill. Teach the doctrine of salvation and eternal destiny. Benefits of the boots on the ground? Fulfill the mandate of the church. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord gave us the mandate. We can't fill them. We can't do anything. We must do our mandate. The Lord will do the rest. Promote and recruit members for the assembly. So the strong suggestion is, and I'm going to close, is that all of us, this is where our online hybrid come in. My suggestion is that all of us standardize our online some of our online service, like our Sunday morning service that visitors come to, and Bible studies that visitors come to, and, and youth service in a little business card. Amen? And now, when you go and boost and you go and you make contact, you just give them a business card and say, join us online. So on Sunday morning, when you go online, you have touched their heart, you have spoken to them, they can now log in. So on your online portal now, you're going to see a lot of new faces. And you say, oh, I am from, it's the person who is managing can check it. And if you say, oh, I'm from Jews land. I am from down Wildman Street. You left me a card. I'm logging on my phone. So now you are marketing, you are promoting the, 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 the assembly. And you are recruiting members of the assembly to an online portal. And not only that, you create and train an army of workers. So you have a lot more young men who sit down in the church. And the, the word of God is in them. To them, just give up and just sit down. And the, the, they're getting a chance to teach. So you have 10 teachers, 20 moderators, a lot, and you're creating an army to take your community. And after you have exhausted, then we can move to Judea and Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the earth. Amen. That was like a marathon. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I'm doing you have to keep time, you know, because. All right, 703. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord is good. Stronghold in the time of trouble. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Boots. We have, we have been, as I said, we have been doing it. Um, last Sunday night, we were on Reddell's Road. Yes, the busy Reddell's Road. Right be abundant life is up there past them. There's a little end camp area. And we went there and we had boots on the ground and we set up and preached the gospel. Amen. Police pass us. One time I see a siren I come 
But the Duane will tell you, and I said, Why am I coming first now? But coming down the wall. Whoa, 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 whoa. But they just drive past and go about them business. They never trouble us. We were out there. When you look at crowd, we, we were doing, we were setting example for the community. Because where we were, we had our mask. We were social distancing, doing our thing. When you look across the road, there were people at a bar, they're not social distancing, they're not the whole of them over there at the bar having a little party. People over the jerk center having them jerk thing, two group of men over there, so I played them and over on them small table. If they lock us down, they have to lock down everybody. I'm not saying they can't, they can. But I'm saying we were not breaking any, we were following the protocol. We had six feet apart, we had on our mask, and we, the, 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 the microphone was six feet apart, and we tried to maintain it throughout the thing. I'm saying we have been out there, and the, 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 the police have not stopped us. We want to thank them for that, and I think it's because we have, we have maintained the protocols. No? Yes, and, and there are results coming. Results are happening. One lady have requested baptism, a backslider has decided to come home, and a couple has requested they want to get married. Yeah, yes. And people are hearing the gospel. We're supposed to pick up a young man Sunday for church. We were there when Thursday night, last Sunday, he wants to get saved. Him saying, want to get saved. So we arranged a pick up for Sunday. So there are people out there who want God. And you don't need a crowd. Ten of you can do it. Where two or three are gathered in his name is in the midst of bless. And the final thing is, and this is a national directive. We want, an, we want to implement it in Region 1 in the shortest possible time. The idea is to teach every single member of our congregate. With this boot on the ground and finding so many people who will log into our program and want to be a part of it. The idea is to teach every single member of Region 1, every single member of your church to be our own Bible study teacher. Not just a small group, but every single member must be taught how to teach own Bible study. So you can teach it on the job, teach it at school, teach it to them friends, teach it to their neighbor. Not just a small group, no. All of us. Because you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But not just some, but all. God bless you. In Jesus' name. I'm ask Minister Nelson to come. He's going to introduce the next speaker. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, um, Pastor King, for you know, your presentation about boots on the ground. God is a good God. Amen. Amen. Nothing stops God from moving. No pandemic. Amen. Souls still can be saved. Amen. So right at this time, we'll be having our... And we're here about cell ministries, formulating and implementing cell ministries in the church. Now, what is that? So coming to present that to us is our beloved brother, Minister, Minister Royal Rainford. Amen. Come on, let's welcome him. Hallelujah. Let, let me set up for you.
Cell Group Ministry, you have that at your assembly, let me see your hand. Group Ministry, you might know it as that. No, let me see the hands. No. Yeah, yes, yeah, this is better. So let me see the show of hands. Cell group ministry. Yes. Okay. All right. So hopefully you can get something from this presentation. Um, and let me as well greet my pastor who is not here. And um, a lot of the information that I have here is because of his um, leadership in our own assembly at North Kingston, our Pentecostal sanctuary. All right, so I start with this scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Second great commandment, as you know, found in Matthew 22, verse 39. And this is very important because that is the basis of the whole cell group ministry is to further that commandment to us. All right, so what is cell group ministry? And I'll read for you. The cell group ministry consists of a functional, of functional units. And I emphasize functional because within that unit or group, they are able to perform different activities independently. So it's a cell group ministry consists of functional units or groups formulated from the whole body of the church or assembly that is geared towards ensuring the well-being of each member of the group and then by extension, all the members of the assembly. So simply what we're saying is, within the church, we are creating groups within the church, not breakaway groups for us, really. <laughs> not groups that go in the part, but groups that form smaller segments of persons, of members of that whole assembly. Amen. So that's really what the cell group ministry is effectually trying to do. So you might ask, why CGM, Cell Group Ministry? And it's simple. It allows for an easier or more efficient management of the assembly. Especially for larger assemblies, and especially during a time of COVID, some of our members have left and some of the pastors don't even know. They know when it's too late. Things happen and persons drift away and you don't even realize that brother so-and-so is no longer here. Sister so-and-so no longer here for whatever reason. So the whole formulation of the group is to try to manage this situation, to be aware of this situation and to intervene at the appropriate time. Amen? All right. So, in a general sense, we're talking about the well-being of each member. We're looking at their spiritual needs. We're looking at the physical needs. We're looking at the emotional needs. The whole man. We're not leaving a part alone. Now, when you say physical needs, you might say, boy, the church can't do so much. Especially the resources are stretched now, but even in a small way, to be aware of some of the, the challenges that individuals face and to make small steps in trying to address them means a lot to that member or that saint. Amen? So what we're trying to do is to understand that the pastor can't see everything. Poor pastor, sometimes he's so busy in the whole management of the church 
And sometimes some of these things slip away. No fault of his or her. her. So what we try to do is form smaller groups within the church under the leadership of the pastor, ultimately, that we are aware of all the situation and issues affecting the saints. Amen. Everybody follow me so far. Amen. All right. So before we even start in thinking about creating the cell group ministry, there are three important things. I suggest that we need to be aware of. The first one is very important. You need to know who are the available leaders that you can ask to lead these cell groups. It's an important function. And one of the challenges that I know some of the churches have is that not many persons are making themselves as available and to offer leadership in the various capacities of the church. So when you start thinking about creating or formulating cell groups, think about as well, who are the persons you can call upon to offer leadership to these groups? And we'll see later on what are the things that we're going to look for in terms of administering or managing these groups. You as well have to think about your congregation size. If you have a hundred members, you probably and you have two or three or four persons, you probably can say have a group, each four groups of twenty-five. But if you only have two leaders that you can call on, you have to say two groups of fifty. So you have to be mindful of your congregation size. The other thing I have here is your reporting structure. And what do I mean by that? Some of us have assistant pastors. Or you have persons who are acting in a ministerial capacity to offer ministerial support. So if you have that tier before you reach the pastor, you can have more groups reporting to that person who in turn report to the pastor. So you have to be mindful of these things when you're thinking about formulating or putting in place cell groups. If you have that interim or that intermediate step before the pastor, you can have more, per, more groups reporting to that person, and then that person now feeds up the information to the pastor. Amen. Now, let's talk about the cell group ministry set up or construct. And I'll read here. Ideally, members of the assembly can be divided into groups consisting of between 10 to 20 members. You don't really want a very big, mini, big group, nor a very small group. Amen? So it's that in-between number. And of course, this number will be based on your own assembly, as I said before, in terms of what is the number of persons as members of your assembly. So what we want to do is to ensure a closer interaction among members and a closer involvement in the work of the assembly. Groups can be determined using surnames. Amen? So you might say if you have, when you look at your general members listing, if you have, if you want in four groups and you have 100, if A to D is 25 members, you might announce in your congregation that persons whose surnames beginning with A and ending with D, you'll be a member of group one, for argument's sake. As well, you could divide them by birth months. And that is how we do it at Pentecostal Sanctuary. And I tell you something. We started, our, ours is known as group ministry. We don't have the cell in front of it, group ministry. But we started with 12 groups. And I was once a 
group leader when we had 12, but also bombarded with things that Pastor realized uh, 12 can't cut it. <laughs> so you scale it down to four. Amen? So you have January, February, March, April in one group, and so forth and so forth. And that is working quite well. And in fact, we started this before COVID. And we realized that when COVID, the onset of COVID and we couldn't meet, we could drop on the cell groups. Because we already had, the, 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 we had already set up those ministries. We had those WhatsApp group with the members there. So it was easy to disseminate information. It was easy as well to break down the congregation because everybody couldn't hold in the church again. So we said group one and group two. And we switch it up. So through the vision and the wisdom of our pastor, we were able to move smoothly into that. Thank God. God is good. Amen. Right. So you can think about using the birth months or just simply put in certain persons in group. And you might have to do that depending on your congregation. Amen. Because if you see the mix of persons, you may say, okay, four leaders, so and so go there and so and so go there. You might just tailor fit it to fit your congregation. The next important thing is give the group a name. So we had 12 initially, we, you named them the 12 names of the tribes of Israel. Right, so we had those things, but when we started to, you know, go down, we eliminated some names and stuck with a few remaining ones. But give them a name, give it life. What is a child without a name? Each group must have a leader and a working team, and a team may consist of a recording secretary and a treasurer. Why I say that? And I'll mention it later on. But you want somebody to take a register of who is there. So first you get a list of all the members from perhaps the church secretary. And then after that, you break it down into the various groups. You give each group a register with those persons who belong in their group. Amen. And each time you call a cell group ministry, that secretary would record the persons who are there, the persons who are absent, importantly, because we want to reach those persons who are absent before we forget them and never know that it's long time them absent and them gone. Amen? Right. And as well, I added a treasurer. Because you want to do things as a group together. And what you find with the group, you can say, okay, have a minuscule amount that they call fees through the pastor i add say a hundred dollars so when time you come to have a trip or an outing and it's now ten thousand dollars as the budget for that because of the one hundred dollar they came each time and gave to the treasurer you find that you have five thousand already so it's not an onerous task at that time to find the five thousand balance Amen? But I add, do it through the blessings of your pastor. Amen. All right. You as well develop rude rules and guidelines for this ministry. And as well, you meet with the leaders and the supporting team to share the vision. Amen? Do it a workshop, ideally. Each cell group ideally meet at least once per week or every fortnight. Amen? And what I say here are recommendations, but how we started as well, we chose a night that they already would have been coming to church. So for example, if one night we regularly have a Bible study or a prayer meeting, so one night out of the month, or if it's a fortnight, right, we have that night designated group ministry. So if we are having it in the assembly, we have everybody here, like we have everybody here. 
we have the introduction and we whatever first, and then we break out into groups. And when we're finished, we come back again as one big unit and we speak and we dismiss. Something like that. But you as well could consider what you want for your assembly and make it work. The other recommendation is to plan meetings properly. And as I said, this is when you work with your leaders, your leader and the team. Plan a meeting that persons are interested in. Sometimes we plan some meetings where no effort never put into it. You have to respect person's time. When they come out, they must feel that it was worth it. They felt a sense of accomplishment, achievement by being there and fellowship with the brothers and sisters. So you plan something that you know will engage them and leave them with a feeling that the next time it is called, I will be there. Amen? All right. So at the meeting, make the meeting light and enjoyable and not lasting more than one hour. We're not creating another service. We're not creating another opportunity to share the gospel message. We have that in the services already. We have that in the Bible study. This is of a different nature. It's a lighter engagement. Amen? And if I know when we started, some of the members were so longing for it. You know, it's like a breath of fresh air where they could sit on a light occasion where they listen to persons' situation, you know, testimonies on a smaller basis. You know, and they say, pray for so-and-so because my son will give me a problem. You know, and we talk and we talk and we advise her and we encourage her and, you know, and, you know, we ask about sister so-and-so who have, is sick. You know, what, how she doing? And we say, all right, we're going to plan a little activity and carry a basket to her with some goods. You deal with the toiletries. You deal with some thin things. We come together and go down there. You realize what is happening? We're trying to ensure that no one is left behind. And it's a distance away from the pastor. But the pastor is abreast. And, as, and when the report comes in, he knows of that situation. Sometimes as well, the limited funds that are within the group not enough. So the cell group leader informs the pastor and says, Pastor, can certain certain amount of funds be made available? So we can do this for that sister. Hallelujah. You realize how that sister or brother feels when that little intervention happens? And we can't blame the pastor because the pastor sometimes is way up there. Amen? But if you can create these cell groups with good leadership that can feed information and intervene at the right time. Amen? And see to the needs of those, you know, individuals. It makes a world of a difference. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So, allow time for general updates, you know. Budget what's in the kitty, you know, what happened to so-and-so. Give them a time to relax. And I said, no more than one hour. Pray for persons. Listen to their concerns and allow members to participate. You know, I remember one group meeting. We had this elder person and a younger person. You know, and the younger person was speaking about something related to her age group. And the elder sister said, you think you just born? Uh, you think I just know me born? Me can tell you something when me used to go to you, you know. You know, and just to see that little interaction and the youngster listening and taking it in. You know, you, you don't find that naturally happening sometimes. But if you create that little environment, you, you'll be surprised the things that happen that encourage the small and the old in terms of their path and where they're going. Amen. Hallelujah. 
So the cell group, there are some areas of focus that you could think about. You can pray together for people and areas of the community that you would like to impact. The cell, will be, the cell group will be responsible for helping each other to look after those who are weak spiritually. And why I have some of these in this document here is for those assemblies who, that don't have certain ministries. For example, at Pentecost Sanctuary, we have a seniors ministry. Amen? So we have a ministry leader who is responsible for the seniors in the assembly. We have a new convert ministry. So to the extent that you don't have some of these ministries separately, it's a good way to incorporate it into the group ministry to achieve the same objectives. But should you have these other ministries, you might not necessarily want to include them under the group ministry here. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. All right. So, alternate cell, alternate, alternate cells, that mean the different groups could meet in the homes of shut-ins. You find that the shut-ins are sometimes left out, especially in the time of COVID. Amen. But if you say group one, you know go down to sister so-and-so, and have a small gathering there, you know, and have a church there, service there. That sister no longer would feel that she's left out, amen? And you find that as well, the relationships that can be built, you know, between brothers and sisters would be super greatly increased, amen? So you don't necessarily burden one group with it, but you could rotate it among groups with a scheduled list of persons. Amen? To minister to. You could also adopt different elderly or needy saints and I said provide support for them in whatever way you can. As well, as I said, in our assembly, we have a mechanism where we can move it up the ladder where the groups might not be able to manage certain interventions so we ask group leaders once it comes to their attention to make it known to the bishop and the bishop will now see to an appropriate intervention the cell groups would also be responsible for visiting the new converts in their area and as i said this will build a sense of awareness of the new converts in their area and a greater sense of responsibility for their salvation and preservation, preservation. Sales group could have outdoor sessions in the parks and markets. You don't necessarily have to meet at church, amen. Our group one day, well, another group, one day went to Port Royal and they had fish, <laughs> amen. So that was their fellowship. They went afterwards and they just sat in a different area at the park, another group, and they, you know, just fellowship one with another, amen, over ice cream. As simple as that, but it made a world of a difference. Okay, sales with the pastor's permission, I said, could collect the food or money or love offering. Amen. Because sometimes what we do, we might have a basket or a drum with a particular purpose. And we ask persons to donate towards that. And everything goes to that person we are targeting. Amen. Another one I want to share with you, and I say I thank our pastor, Pastor Robert Ellis, as well, because you know there are so many initiatives that come from him that I believe is worthy to be shared. Another thing is to help use the cell group ministry in your evangelistic effort. So if you have track distribution, amen. If you have, we call it personal Bible study, amen, because it's personal to every individual. Amen. So where you go, the people who you interact with, we try to engage them in a personal way. Amen. Because sometimes, especially now, you cannot get the big meeting. Amen. But each of us on a daily basis interact with several persons 
who are unsaved. So we call it personal Bible study, where we target individuals to have a study with. You may not have that study or to do that study, but you can get that person to have a study with a trained personal Bible study teacher. Because what we did as well, we trained a corset of persons to, treat, to teach personal Bible study. And another one, first time visitors. Now what I mean, what I mean by this now? So what we have done is, through the group ministry, we formulated a competition. Amen? Whereby, how many tracks you have distributed by the group? So if your group is your 10, my group 20, another group say 20 or 10, so it's 15 all, say that is worth 10 points. So because you gave out 10 out of the 50, you get 10 out of 50 times the amount of points available. So we award points for the various categories. So if you as well, your group, encourage four persons to visit church in that particular quarter. We do it quarterly in terms of the awarding of the winner of the competition. So your group performed well by inviting more persons to visit the assembly as first time visitors, we award you based on how many persons you, you, uh, you invited compared to the next. So quarterly what we do now is announce a winner for the quarter in the evangelistic thrust. Are you surprised to see how the group starting to compete? It's just perhaps a cake at Price Mart, you know. <laughs> But they're so engaged in trying to outdo the other group. And they start to work as a team in trying to reach persons and working to evangelize. That's the creativity that it can come through with the group effort. Amen? Amen. And I'm touching down. So possible format for the meetings, and this is just a recommendation. You start with a prayer, the worship, you know. Um, you could have a topical Bible study, a little discussion, question and answers, you know, prayer. You, you can adjust your certain group leader, tailor fit it, but ensure that it is light. We don't want a heavy service. They don't want another heavy service. It's really about fellowship, sharing, and they're just encouraging each other through their journey. Amen? Amen. So I believe... We have one last slide, and in closing, cell leaders should see deep fellowship and greater unity among the saints, more prayer and more answered prayers, more souls saved from their area, and the retention, importantly, retention and involvement of more of our members. Amen? If these are not seen, and the leader should not take the, necessary, should take the necessary steps to ensure that the program works. And I encourage you with this because you're not going to get it right initially. As I said, our start with 12, we have a scale down. But you just have to constantly work at it. Work at it. Encourage them. Amen? The follow-up activities especially. Because saints like to say when things are followed through on. Amen? God bless you all. I hope that you would have learned something from my presentation. God bless you all. Praise God, praise God. We're going to be going into our next presentation, but we want to take a 10 minutes. Is there any questions on the first two presentations? Um, just for 10 minutes, and then we'll go into our next presentation. That's not right. 
there's a there's a vehicle that is blocking a gate is nine five five nine J C or nine three three nine J C is five five nine or three three nine. They are blocking a gate. Right. Is there any question on any of the two presentations? Yes. But really, the other question, he said when he came into Pentecost, there were some places with borders that he shouldn't go in to evangelize. Any, any feedback on that one? The question was, if you're in a community where there are other Pentecostal churches, are you free to evangelize those areas? Or you have to respect borders? You heard now, Minister Smith? Pastor, Shel Pastor Gerald Smith, you heard the question? that he's already in the neighborhood but my understanding when you're going into a new community if there's a Pentecostal church there then you're an apostolic church there then you um, then you respect the borders or you consult with the pastor and, so, and you make an arrangement or something like Well, I was looking at the borders that are established, and I was saying I live in a community where there's a Pentecostal church. I do not now attend that Pentecostal church in my community. I also work in a community that has three Pentecostal churches in adjoining areas, and they have students and parents from all those areas. So sometimes it brings about some form of restriction as to what to say, what not to say. You would point them to the nearest Pentecostal church at times, but sometimes they would go there and don't get the reception. And also, when you live in a community where, there are, where there's a Pentecostal church, it puts a restriction as to how do you evangelize to your neighbors because your neighbors would want to go to church with you, but you are not going to the church that is in your community. Just a quick answer, and personal evangelism has no border. First, personal evangelism has no border. First, personal evangelism. Is that understood? If my neighbor is not going to church, even if 20 Pentecostal churches are around them, I can witness to my neighbor, and they can go to it and take them to church. Personal evangelism has no border. But if we're going to have a street meeting near another church, it would be good to just inform the other pastor and consult him and find out if he wants to join you. But if he's not having street meeting and he's locked up in there, I don't see why you shouldn't go and have your street meeting. So I think that kind of statement needs to be formalized because it, it really hurts at times when you are in certain areas. See the people really dying, you see them suffering, you know they really want the word, but nothing is up happening in that particular community and even sometimes when proposals are made it's not follow up on so what do you really do any 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 other response to that any other answer any other question we still have seven minutes yeah pastor smith mike you need the mic here yeah? you could just could use these, I'm like, could walk with it, I guess. Um, 
personally, I don't believe that there is any substitute for dialogue and communication before action. So I, I just believe that um, in a, first of all, if I'm in a community and there are adjoining Pentecostal churches in another area, I think that the first thing should happen is that there should be good dialogue between pastors who are adjoining to each other. When you have that kind of communication, then you can establish uh, virtual boundaries. Right? You can establish virtual boundaries. And you can always have discussions. I don't know any pastor who would refuse help to have a street service in his community. I, I don't know, unless that pastor don't have any call for evangelism on his life or his ministry, and I don't know that you can be a pastor without a call for evangelism in your ministry. And so if a, a number of churches, or I know churches who are not going out on the road, and that is because of other reasons. Sometimes they don't think that they have the kind of equipment that would allow them to make the kind of impact that they want to make. And so they, they're not going home. But if there's another adjoining pastor who has the equipment, I don't see how that pastor, another pastor, would refuse the assistance in this community. Um, persons get a little bit um, edgy because they think that their community and the persons in their community, they'd like to see them come to their assembly. And every pastor feels that way. I don't know if anybody would like to know that somebody that is just near to their assembly is gone all the way four or five miles to another church. Praise the Lord. But Praise God. if that is what happens, that is what happens. But I think that we just have to have dialogue and, uh, and communicate with each other and trust each other in terms of how we behave as pastors. Any, we still have four minutes for the 10 minutes. Any other question? on the presentation. Praise God. Uh, maybe I could use it to interject. For, for Boots on the Ground, one of the things we want to do, the region, region one has equipment. Um, what we're thinking about rationalizing our equipment, I think we have about 10 boxes. We are thinking of getting some additional mixer and we could split those equipment into five set of operating outdoor outdoor devices so we can use so if you are a pastor if you are at a church you identify an area that meet the criteria remember all protocols observe no more than 10 to 12 person on the site to, because public gatherings should be more than 15 so there'll be no more than 10 or 12 or 15 maximum or you know standing six feet apart Wearing the mask, observing all protocol, teaching or preaching the gospel in the community. All protocols observe. We are even taught of the idea as a region. We have a lot of young men in the region and women who have a call for evangelism and ministry who are willing to be out there every night. I believe in Region 1, we can be on the road every single night in one of these communities. If your church don't have the resources, and the, and the teacher, the preacher, the equipment, you identify the area nonstop, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even Saturday and Sunday. We will be in a community teaching the word. The only thing that is stopping us from getting that happening is the, is the cost, is the money. We have the human resources and we have the equipment. We're even thinking if we can have two and three one night, we have the equipment, we can get it going to fill region one with our doctrine. So we need to find a way to, to what you call it now? To raise the funds. It will cost us about, when we did the estimate, to get all, all the resources together, it's about 15 to $20,000 per night to, 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 to do that. And have a dedicated team to provide all the, the assistance to, to get it done. Amen, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. 
At this time, we go into our next presentation, creating an effective online Great. congregation, uh, online ministry. Amen. What am I talking about in this presentation? They are going to come and tell you in Jesus' name. So, Sister, Brother, Minister Nelson, amen, and there are some others working with him on this presentation. Amen. Praise God, everybody. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. God is a good God. Amen. Amen. So we're so delighted to be here. Um, a group of us came together, myself, Minister Sheldon Smith, and our beloved sister, Sister Tanisha Rainford, and we work together in terms of establishing or putting this together, this presentation together, creating an effective online congregation. Amen? Creating an effective online congregation. One year ago, or maybe two, uh, let us say one year ago, if we were, if you have ever mentioned, uh, ever, ever mentioned it to a brother or a sister, or maybe to your leader, that I'm going to stay home and I'm going to stay at service by Zoom or online. Maybe you get a sharp rebuke. If you ever tell them that I'm going to be on Zoom one year ago or nine months ago, I, Pastor or my brother and sister, I'm going to stay home and I'm going to be on Zoom. You, you get a sharp rebuke. But look what this pandemic has done. There's a paradigm shift. And I tell you something, nothing can stop the church. When there's crisis, we have a God who you can find treasure in it. Amen? Amen. And right now we... So, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And he shall be... Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And many times we think, and a year ago also, if we want to go anywhere, the first thing will come to our thought is a plane. But now technology has broken those geographical boundaries and it has birthed in process or birthed to us what is called an online ministry now what is an online congregation an online congregation can be referred to an internet church an on online church cyber church or a digital church and this refers to a wide variety of ways that church groups can use the internet to facilitate our religious activities particularly prior discussion preaching and worship but an online congregation is a part of an online ministry we have to now see this thing as a ministry and see this ministry as a a a, a, a agent that can reach the world so your church can be a church without geographical boundaries you can reach the lost, not just in your community, not just in your country, but also in the world. The scripture says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. We need to spread the gospel. And, 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 and an opportunity has been created. It was always there, but it's now pronounced right up in our face, technology. And we can use this technology to win the last anywhere in the world. Now, what is this goal of this online ministry? First, to share the gospel. You have to see this online ministry as a tool in which we can use it to share the gospel. No, we can become a global evangelist by right here in Jamaica. 
we can become a global evangelist right here in Jamaica. Sharing the gospel, the experience of a gospel. We can use it to explore Bible doctrine, strengthen our faith, and prepare persons for, for end time. What we have now is not a congregation. We have online viewers who every Sunday might just tune into your particular um, church and view it. No, we want to move from viewership to conversion, to involvement, to retention. No longer we're just going to, we're just going to just, you know, allow you just to watch it. We want to move you or move the viewers from viewership to conversion, to involvement, to retention. We're going to go win our souls by, by all means, do what we can by all means so that we can save some. And this technology has provided that medium and provided that opportunity. Typical example, some times ago at, at Facebook, I think a few weeks ago, on the Facebook, there was a list of names that were on our Facebook page. And you know what they want? They wanted prayer. And that is a great thing. Now, that could be an opportunity where we get what? We get their contact. We can put them in a cell group. And the minister, or the minister who God put in charge of that can have dialogue and find out. We can Zoom them. We can Zoom them. It says for us, since it's 10. We can Zoom them. Have a Zoom meeting. And then we're going to talk to them and ask them if they want to know more about God and we can use that medium right there and then and share the salvation plan. So we can move them from viewership to now conversion. Right there, I've heard it, Dr. D David Bernard I gave a report of persons receiving the Holy Ghost. And persons interested to be baptized in Jesus' name. And persons who have received healing. The Holy Ghost don't know no geographical boundary. So you can be right here and somebody gets saved in, in Spain. By the power of the Holy Ghost. So our minds now have to be, you know, or, 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 and, and, and if our church can now be, you know, global center. I'm attacking the community that I'm in. I'm attacking the, the country. And I'm going to do the best that I can do to see if I can win the world. The best that I can do so that some can be saved. So while they're watching, and, you, and they, they, you know, many persons watch it, and they put a thumbs up, they like it. Yes, I want you to like it, but I also want you to love Jesus and get saved. So this, this type of a thing, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that the, the Lord is allowing, because it creates an opportunity where we, can, where we can reach more souls. So we're moving them from just being an audience to find means and way to convert them and get them involved. So like we have a screen and stuff, or, you know, and those persons who have been share the gospel and get saved overseas, you know what can happen? You know, on a Sunday morning, we can say, um, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Right now, we're going to ask brother, brother John Brown. He's all the way in Africa, or he's all the way in China, or he's all the way in Paris, and he'd be reading the scripture. Brother John Brown, go ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave all the way. And we are right here in Jamaica. And because of the impact that we have in that far, foreign land, that person, by the power and the help of God, can save many. Because of this little island in Jamaica. So even though we are in a third world country, we have a first world mentality that we are attacking the world and see how much we can save some. Come on, if you love God, put your hand together for God, man. Come on. Come on. Amen. 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 You know, 
oh, never don't get carried away. You know? <laughs> I'm enjoying this Jesus. I'm enjoying this Jesus. And for the rest of my life, I, my time may be short on earth. And whatever time I have, I just want to give my best. I'll just lift your hands one more time and just magnify the Lord. This is all about him. We're going to go full on dread. Give him everything that he wants. And that's why saving the soul is what he loved. And that's what we must do. Everything. So that we can save some. Hallelujah. Oh God. Oh Lord. Now another goal of the online. So we look at sharing the gospel which is one. We look at the, the, the other goal is to grow your church membership. Grow your church membership. Have a, a global status to it. And that is just the whole aim of the, to, to win the loss. Another is meeting the community needs. How we do we do that? No. Anywhere we go, there's always challenges. People going to need counseling. You can stay right here as a pastor, as a minister, as a brother, as a sister, and come to somebody who's depressed, suicidal tendency, maybe marital issue. You can stay right here and counsel them. A matter of fact, somebody who may be possessed with demons, just zoom them, zoom them, right? Brother, um, you can phone them too and zoom them in. You always say, don't know how that <laughs> Do all we can do. It can work. It can work. It happened. It happened. Zoom them in. Bring them in. Zoom them. And you stay right here in Jamaica and deliver them. Remember, you know, it's not by might. Hold on. You think it's you, your little strength? Your little strength going to this thing here? It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by the spirit of the Lord. It's God going to do it. Hallelujah. And God has created a forum where he must operate. And we must allow him to operate. Use every medium as possible. So that God will be glorified. Oh God. Uh, let me run on. No prayer session. Somebody from Africa can be sick. All you just want them to do is just have them cell phone. And carry the cell phone straight where to those persons are. And you are on the line and zoom them in. And pray for that person that is sick. So you are visiting the sick and you are in Jamaica. And the sick is over there in Africa. Or Canada or Mexico. So we can meet the community needs. We can provide counseling, prayer session. We can even minister to the shutting and the elderly over there. Bring a TV, a nice little a flat laptop. And zoom them in and we can pray for them and be with them. And tell them how much they look good elderlies and encourage them so that's one of the goal and, and, and another is involving the youths the young people are tomorrow's leader and we and they, they love the technology so this is a way of involving the youths that they remain focused they want to serve God come yeah involving the youths with this technology what can happen is that you can use it to have Sunday school with persons overseas, Bible study. And we can involve the youth, they develop the prerequisite skill. And those who might not know it, carry them in and make them be trained. So what happens with that? We can now begin to teach the youth home Bible study so they can conduct home Bible study. Woo! So some of the, the online platforms like social media, which you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, podcast, etc. The conference platform, Zoom, Microsoft Team, WhatsApp, call, yeah, even the WhatsApp. You can get a group of them on a WhatsApp and name it the International Saints and provide a lot of opportunities for them by talking and conducting prayer meetings and sending some, some, some scriptures and encouraging words. No, let I tell you something. Let I tell you something. Technology is powerful. My beloved minister, my brother and friend in Christ, um, Minister Sheldon, and what he had done is, when we're on the boots on the ground, he normally videos it. And when his thing go, it go very live, wide, worldwide. A lot of people see it all over. 
because of what is being, and, and that is why what we need to do, we need to publicize Christ. We need to promote Christ. Christ must be seen in the world. Because of that, somebody wants now to dedicate their baby. What, what we're going to say, what, what we're going to, what we're going to, well, Okay, I'll leave that for the elders. But what are we going to do? They want the baby to be dedicated. I know it's our tradition, you know? COVID, COVID, come at a place, you know, you're going to shake certain traditions, you know? You're going to, yeah, you're going to, we can't shake it. But they want the baby to be dedicated, and they want the church to dedicate the baby. Where they're at now, they have some, maybe some internet problems. So it seems that they're in an area that maybe the possibility not, church is very far. And this is an opportunity where we can minister to them, doing these little things, dedicating their baby, and then minister to them. And you never can tell. They can end up being saved and winning more souls where they are at. So using these media create this opportunity where men will know Christ and be saved. Information hub, like your website, it's good to have the website, Google Drive. On your website, you can create a website, and on your website, you can even have an online resource center where they can go and visit the site and see all kind of uh, the doctrine, salvation, about holiness. You can create that opportunity. And it can be so intimate that they can say, which church you attend? I church. I attend such and such church in Jamaica. This person is my pastor. So the pastor, look up, go to them house, by what? Zoom, and pray for them. God has created opportunities. God has created opportunities where we can not just have a community impact or a nation impact, but also a global impact through technology and through this online ministry that can be birthed in your church. It's so good to have our beloved sister Tanisha Rainford and she'll be coming right now to share in this presentation. Praise the Lord everyone. You can hear me well? I can hear me better. Yes, yes. So this online ministry, who would have thought, as Brother Nelson said, that we would have been here at this time? Praise the Lord. But we are here, right? And I believe that we're living in some exciting times and extraordinary times. Praise God. God has carried us out of our comfort zone for us to realize that he is in charge and he is piloting the way. Praise God. So we just have to hold on to what is true and go forth with God. But in all of what Brother Nelson said, we might be wondering, man, this thing is expensive to do. Some of us as churches, we have started it already in Region 1. Some of us are well on our way, like Pentab that has been there for quite a while. North Kingston, who has a ministry in it. Some other churches have their ministry, and some other churches are just starting out. But this is a beautiful ministry, and you can do it no matter what your circumstances is. Our circumstances are rather the cost of an online ministry can be free and limited depending on what you're working with. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Who knew about Zoom long ago? Only some persons in corporate Jamaica that were using Zoom because they couldn't meet as they ought to. You have other conference platforms that are also free, not only Zoom. Zoom is now popular. You know why it became popular? Because the person who made Zoom was running on the, is it the Republican ticket for the U.S. elections? That, what was his name again, Brother Ruel? Yap, Yan, that gentleman. And it became popular then, and it had a lot of deficiencies when it started, but it moved on. But there are other platforms. It is it's a limited setup cost. The only thing that you might have that, you, that is a constant cost 
is your internet. And as a country, we have been suffering in that regards, right? All of us have been suffering because the network is overloaded now because of all of what is happening island-wide, right? Software and hardware cost you might have to, but those things are limited. Some of the most beautiful services that we might think is using some high-tech and high-definition video camera is just using a cell phone. Just a simple cell phone that has great graphics. That's all it's using with an audio cord that plugs into the mixer board, and that's it. And we might think that, wow, this church has a beautiful system going, but that's all they have. And they are making it work, right? So it doesn't take a lot. You just take a phone. You plug it into the, uh, the audio, into the mixer board, and you have internet there, and you can go. Some persons might think that even Zoom use a lot of data. So I had to test it out. One night, we were having a meeting at church, and I had set up the meeting, and there was an island-wide power outage or in most areas. And I had data on my phone, and I was the host, and I had to run the meeting on my data because persons were coming on because they are all over, and they might, have, um, they might have light where they are. And my one day, the first part of the data, what is it? One day, 500 mega, megabyte, it ran my Zoom meeting. I was surprised. But when you turn on the video on a Zoom meeting, it uses more bandwidth. Or when you turn off the video, it uses less bandwidth. So you can run an hour service right on your 500 megabyte Zoom data. Right? So sometimes it is limited of information why we think that things cost a lot, but it doesn't have to cost a lot. The online ministry has to have a team. This is now a ministry. It's not a little part of the church. It has evolved into a ministry because there are people there that we have to minister and cater to, and it needs dedication. I can tell you at our church and i'm going to use some examples we started out with just a media ministry at church and the media ministry was set up just to project the songs on the screen right upload some photos to our facebook page a persons in the diaspora can see what's happening at north kingston we didn't use to put up videos we just used to put up pictures right and any information that is happening if we're having a evangelistic service and any other thing that we're having right so we just had a media ministry. And what used to happen just from that is that we used to get persons who are interested by what they are seeing. A lot of people, and that's what marketing does, you appeal to the senses, the eyes, the ears, what you can see, what you can hear, what you can taste. That's why grace have tasting in the supermarket, because when you taste it, you bite. So it appeals to our senses. And that's what the media, the, the, the Facebook used to do with the photos. And we had persons who would send us messages and say, you know, I want to come to your church. And I think they were talking to the pastor. A lot of them, they're talking to the pastor. Hi, pastor. I like your church. Can I come to your church? Where are you located? And you answer them and you invite them and you say, okay, you're not talking to pastor. You're talking to Sister Rainford. But when you come, ask a usher for me. I'll be there waiting to meet you. I want to greet you. I want to see you. I want to, you know, introduce myself to you. And you captivate them and they come. And that's what the scene was doing. When we started to show videos, it had another dimension. I remember in August, and I got a message on the, the, the church's Facebook page introducing herself, and she started to ask some questions of Jesus. Thank God Brother Ruel was beside me, so I started to feed him the questions, and he started to give me the answers. And in giving me the answers, I realized I was doing a personal Bible study, just like that. And after that, she said, can I... I think his brother will say, invite her to church to meet so we can study with her. I did so. I took the day from work to join them, and we were there. And she came to, to, to the meeting with brother Rainford, and he had his personal Bible study with her. And from that, she started to come to Tuesday fasting. 
And from Tuesday fasting, she was at Sunday school, new converts. And she was engrafted after that, Brother King, into the group ministry. Now she's on the WhatsApp group link. She's getting information on the Zoom links and the other information about church. And she's now participating just by viewing the services on the social media platform. And what the online ministry does is that it brings the whole cookie together. When they come there, they move to the cell ministry, move to the home Bible study ministry, and it becomes a whole dynamic and somebody becomes involved, converts, praise the Lord Jesus who went through them, right? They become involved and you retain them as members. And that is where we are going now in this dispensation. So it needs a team, it's not a one-man band. Because it now becomes a ministry. You need a team leader. You need somebody who can engage in the social media pages that you have. You need, if you have a website, you need a designer. You need somebody to edit your videos if you're going to be putting up still videos. You need a planner. You need a photographer. Right? And you need those persons that will host the different meetings on the different platforms that you have. And it becomes a whole machinery that will impact the church in a great way. Benefits of this online congregation. And the benefits are, it's easy to access. It's so easy. Minister King, this is the first time I can recall since April that I am in a meeting, in a building at this time of the night. Praise the Lord. I've gotten used to being in meetings on Zoom. That's where my meetings are. So I, this is so strange to me to be in a building like this, having a meeting. I've not done this in a very long time because the whole dynamics has changed. Praise the Lord Jesus. So it's easy to access, right? I don't have to rush home, cook the dinner to leave for the kids, run into the vehicle to head to the traffic, to meet, to, to reach to a Bible study or a prayer meeting, right? Everything is so easy to access. And for some, physically attending church can be difficult. With online services, anyone can attend because of how easy it is. All you have to do is to log on, watch, and worship. Praise the Lord Jesus. The, another benefit is that it increases our church attendance. I don't know if you have, for those who have been doing the online, if you have been realizing this, I teach young adults. And my students are coming out better than they did when I was in the sanctuary. I'm getting them out, right? And in getting them out, I'm impacting them more, and I realize that they are, they are getting more involved in the things of the church. Praise the Lord. So I see an increase in attendance, praise God, um, building an online community, which is a great community. On Saturday, the Pentecostal Sanctuary, along with Heart to Heart Talk Show, we had our singles conference online. We had over 500 singles globally who registered for this conference. They registered, they went, they filled out a form, and they registered. At any given time on the Zoom platform, we had over 270 singles that were logged in. I could not believe that on a Saturday from 10 to 2, the numbers did not go down past 270. These were persons from the UK, from Canada, and all over Jamaica, and these were apostolics, apostolic single people. Because I was the MC, or one of the MC at that conference, after the conference ended on the Saturday, I realized that when I went onto my Facebook page, I had some new persons wanting to be my friends. And I was wondering where this glut of friends request came from. But when I look at the names, because they logged onto Zoom with the names, I realized that these names were the names from the conference. 
that heard my name as the MC and now were liking me on my Facebook account. And I confirm all of them, Brother Moses. All of them are confirmed. I don't know them, but I confirm them and I don't really do that. <laughs> right? Because my page is private. But I confirmed them because I realized there was a connection. And I wanted to feed them from my page. And they can see healthy posts and good posts about God. So this is a domino effect that we can create from just that. I saw four beautiful young ladies at church walking in Sunday. Young people. And in my spirit, I just felt it's because of the conference that they were there. Praise the Lord. So sometimes we can't understand everything and what God is doing. But it is best sometimes that when the thing is good and it is true and there's no mark against it, that will flow with God what God is doing because we marvel to see what comes from it. it bene the other benefit is to spread the good news of salvation near and far. Right? Watch an online church with your whole family. Praise the Lord. And I'm sharing this with some testimonies that you can understand the benefits of it. Since the COVID period and the fact that we weren't going out on a Sunday evening, as a family, we started to have Zoom family devotion with family members that are not in Jamaica. And I am so happy that we started that Brother King because the children are looking forward to family devotion with the entire extended family. Questions are being answered from the devotion that would not have been answered otherwise. But because we're sharing, reasonings are happening in the confines of a family in terms of biblical topics. And I believe it is healthy thing, a healthy thing that is happening. And these are the impacts that we can have when you can hear your nephew sharing and giving a thought. Because so many times we spend otherwise, but this platform is being used to minister even in the very home. Praise the Lord Jesus. So it helps a family that would not be coming out. That you're trying to get out, brother Moses. You're trying to get your sister out. Come to church. Come to church. Now come at church. Right? But you come over one Sunday. You have dinner. And you're not going to have service online. And you say, come on, sit down with me and watch your service, man. And you're trying to realize how engaged she is by just watching it with you. Worship in your comfort. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm able to join some midnight prayer meetings that I would never normally join. Praise the Lord if I had to drive to the sanctuary. Praise God. But I can be at home. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praying. And it's not that you wouldn't want to go, you know. But sometimes these things are far. But because... You know, you can make it online if, if a church in Mobe is having an online prayer meeting and you can be there. It would have been harder for you to be there in person. But because they are having it online, you can be there. Collection of tithes and offering. Another good source of getting those tithes and offering. I know first global. You just have to find how to get these things done. Have the ability to open a foreign account that persons overseas can drop into the foreign account. If you have persons who are from a church that are in the diaspora, they can open a Zelle account for you. Praise the Lord Jesus. Transfer it. They can open a cash app account for you and transfer the tithes there. You can collect it real time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Maybe Sister Trudy have some ideas. Praise the Lord Jesus in other ways that you can collect online being in the financial area. Promote the ministry and it works. This is what online does. I've been able to see some churches that I wouldn't, I, I never, I never normally see. I fell in love with a church called Pentecostals of Alexandria. The man guns over this period because of how, how attractive their ministry is. When Sister Mangon can sit in our home and play on our piano and the songs, the hymns from the books can minister to my soul while I'm at my desk at work. That's the impact that an online ministry has. Praise the Lord Jesus. So this has great benefits to us as saints and to those that 
need to hear the gospel of Jesus. Using the online ministry, you have live sermons, live stream of your sermons. You can host prayer meetings, host Bible studies, host Sunday school sessions, host home Bible studies or personal Bible studies, host the cell group meetings, host church meetings, seminars, and conference, record and post devotionals through podcasts, build your biblical reading materials, and generate financial contribution. And Brother Nelson alluded to the fact that one of the goals of the online ministry is to integrate the youths in our assembly. The youths for COVID period, they have been very docile, but the online ministry is an ability to get them working. There's a podcast that I started, and when I was starting it, I didn't know how to get out some of the audio noise on the background and some of the things to do. And I told my bigger son, and he just took it from me. And he opened an app, an audio app, and he edited it and put some nice things behind it. I didn't know he had the ability to do it. And he did it, and it, it, it sounded like first class audio recording. I didn't know he had the ability to do it. But there's so much talent in our young people. And because they sit in church and we don't realize they are there just going away. But if we give them this ministry, give it to them and say, you know, I want you to help with the graphics. I want you to help with the audio. I want you to help with this. You're trying to know what comes from them. I've seen another young man at church that has started to do some video clips. Video clips sensitizing people about the Lord and trying to promote the personal Bible to studies, to personal Bible to studies. He said, come on, you know, and listen a personal Bible study. And three of them come to church and them do the video and record and it, it, the video is so nice and refreshing. But I had no idea that two of the young men that were there had the ability to do that. You know, so this is a great ministry to incorporate, especially our boys. Our boys who are just sitting, boys need to touch and feel and work. And this is a way to incorporate them. Praise the Lord Jesus. And I'm running on to the end. Online congregational guidelines. Know the reason behind your online ministry. Praise the Lord Jesus. What is your why? Why are you starting this? Why do you want to do this ministry? Get your church board on board. That is the leadership of your sanctuary. Get the church members on board to buy into this. This is new. And there's something about when you have change. There needs to be a protocol in change management. Because it's something new and different. Right? You need to hear the views of the people. And reassure them of the aim and the goal of it. Praise the Lord Jesus. Obtain the relevant equipment, software, and human resources to make it effective. It takes great human resource. It takes persons who are dedicated and willing to work and who have a passion for this ministry. Ensure the team leader in this ministry is adequately trained in this area of ministry. And plan very, very important, plan very engaging, not long, but captivating online programs. And this is very important. You cannot carry a three-hour service that you normally have on a Zoom platform to engage the people we are dealing with technology. And the time span of people and their engagement is short. So we can't carry a three-hour Sunday night service on a Zoom platform have to cut out some of the things because it, it, is, it cannot work for our online program. And that's sometimes that we, what, what we find happening. We're trying to carry back the same mode of operation onto the online platform and we lose the very purpose as to why we, we are trying to have this, right? What needs to go out is worship, praise the Lord, and the word of God. Those are the two main points in an online. And... We come down to the second to last slide. An online ministry, it transmits what we're sending out. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. The gospel of salvation. It spreads hope and joy and cheer. Praise the Lord Jesus. And it creates great linkages that 
bonds us together as one unit, one church heading in one destination. Praise the Lord Jesus. So the aim and the relevance of the church will not change with an online platform. So I encourage us to embrace an online platform. Praise the Lord Jesus. It is here to stay. It is effective. It can be used in a great way. And all we have to do is to come together and help each other to build our different online platforms that we can be a, be a force to be reckoned with. God bless you. Hope you enjoyed our presentation. Oh, praise the Lord. It's going so fast. Time is running out. We are asking you for nine o'clock. You can get to them in an hour. That's what the Lord will bless you. We are begging you to. We're going to end at nine o'clock. Amen. The next presentation, the final one, 20 minutes, and then we'll wrap up and get you out of here. Remember, we have some refreshment, well, water and stuff <laughs> outside. Um, Minister Karen McCarge and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, everybody. The topic, hold on a second. I think I'll probably, the timer, turn off the timer, got it. Creating financial opportunities during the COVID season. Um, I would like to start off with a scripture, but first let me greet Reverend King, Pastor King, the church board, all the ministers here, all protocol observes, all those, those that are online, I'd like to greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus, and greetings from Gordon Town. Um, we'll be reading from First Kings chapter 17. This timer, that's not how I set it, but let me just do it this way then. First King chapter 17 verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there.
Praise the Lord. In this time, for us to create opportunities, it has to be through the Lord. And we have to rely on the supernatural abilities of God, not just our own. I took the time to create, to elaborate on the background, not just to tell you go in this industry, go in service, because I'm not sure that alone may help us. We are in unprecedented times. We are normalcy, normalcy of mask wearing, temperature checks, sanitization, minutely physical distancing, church, gathering restriction, massive job loss, blatant attacks on the kingdom, the prevalence of hunger has increased, bills are unpaid, etc. Money has gotten tight, especially tithes and offering. And all of this will impact the church. How do we go forward? I believe personally that whatsoever we need is in the kingdom. I believe that all the raw material, all the human resource, the physical resource, all the equipment that we need, God has already placed it and prepared us. It is just for us to gather together, work together, and make it happen. Philippians 4 verse 19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Right? He has, this is a promise that he has already supplied all our needs. Not just spiritually but physically. Measures seek God for inspiration and motivation. He is the God of the unprecedented times. For God, for, sorry, for us, the body of Christ, to be financially viable, it is imperative that we vigorously work together and support each other. What is financial opportunity? Presenting a situation that offers potential financial gain. Right? What we want is to have a situation where we can get financial gain from it. Without money, the Bible says, money answereth all things. Without money, it is difficult to have church. Right? But for far too long, we have been operating separate. We have been operating on speculation. We know the people in our assembly by name, but not by occupation. We encourage to preach and teach, but the other assets and skill set that person has that can build the kingdom, that can deal with the human part, is underdeveloped. Amen? Sources of, finan sources of opportunities, it can be spiritual, can either come from God, which we are to press towards the mark of the eye calling, or it can come from the devil, which we make no deal with the devil. I say this because it is said by persons that have made it, in order to go further, you have to ask somebody that has already made it. Don't ask somebody that has not made it 
their advice. Chances are you may not get any further. But what is missing most of the times is that most of these, not most, some of these persons make deals with the devil. So the inspiration that they get comes from the forces of darkness. And this is important. So if the wicked can get inspiration from the devil, how much more our God? But in supporting each other, we eliminate a whole, a whole series of factors. We eliminate persons losing job. We eliminate a whole lot of problem just by supporting each other. Hard, we have been taught that hard work and a good education does um, guarantees that you will have financial freedom. I'm sorry that was a lie. It doesn't work. As a matter of fact, you can't pass a certain level without either God taking you there or the devil taking you there. There are, as I said before, there are some economic There are some economic factors. Um, there are some industries that will remain permanently damaged. There are some industries that will not recover. Right? Creating financial opportunities. In approaching the topic of financial opportunities, the overall structure and approach to financial opportunities must be understood. We need to work, we need a working structure as a region or an organization geared to facilitating financial growth and opportunities to its opportunities of its members, supporting each other and what structure exists by implementing biblical principles. And I pause to say that a lot of these billionaires operate on biblical principles. You always hear them giving to charity, giving outside of their own. Sometimes because of scarce resources, we only give to our own and wonder why we don't get help from God. Supporting each other and what structure exists by implementing biblical principles, understanding the market and the direction that it is going, seeking Jesus for direction and blessing and protection. Understanding the market is extremely important. We became digital overnight from extremely analog to extreme digital in two months. Two months. I believe that was remarkable. I knew that there was an agenda to get the world digitized. But to get the world digitized in two months is mind boggling. It is telling us that there are some things that will change. Yesterday, as we know it, will never return in no way, shape, or form. It simply means that there are some industries that are going to die. But like I learned in school, that a great leader or a manager never sees the problem. They see, they see an opportunity. So there are some things that are emerging, and if we jump on it early, we will reap a great reward. And most of these big companies, a lot of them are in societies. Example like the lodge. There's just one of the society that they are a part of and they support their, their own. There's, they support each other. Before they go to their family and support their brothers and sister, their brother 
our sister in the Lord will be supported. Sounds hard, but it is fact. But we have a scripture that says, do good to everyone, especially the household of faith. So we ought to treat each other special. I know it is hard giving some history on what happens when church people do business with church people. But if we understand stages, when you have a child, when they are in their adolescent stage, they make a lot of mistakes and they do a lot of things that are wrong. But they learn from it. And by teaching and applying principles, setting examples, and reinforcing professionalism, I am sure we can go further. Structure. We need a structure of policies, training, events fostered, our approach, building a database, establishing a reliable, communicated as a body. There's a lot of things we don't benefit from because we don't know. We have persons in the body that can help us in various facets of our lives. But because of lack of knowledge, we don't know it. And that is why the BPTA was supporting, or the national body, let me say, because it's not just the BPTA, a national directory. It helps us to understand who we have. You want a plumber, you go check the directory. You have some social issues, we have social workers. We want to know the best approach for our kids, most pastors would like that information. We have teachers. We need some banners. We have somebody in the IT. But we here know it. But how much more in the body don't know it? And I believe, this is my personal belief, that we, the United Pentecostal Church of Jamaica, the largest apostolic body of a greater responsibility of setting some examples and to lead in some regards. Amen. Looking for the needs of the community or members and ways to fulfill it. In embarking on an entrepreneurial adventure or opportunity we need to look for needs you don't just build a shop because the neighbor has a wholesale down the road and it is successful you may build yours and yours don't work but we need to find the need of the community find the need in the assemblies find the need in the church find the need around us. Pastors are pastors not only of the assembly but their community. But finding a need and if there is nobody taking it up, maybe you can fit that need. And there's nothing wrong if the church fits the need and get a financial um, reward from it. It is business. Ties alone will not work. The devil is planning three, four steps ahead of us. We ought to plan and overthrow his plan. Right? As we say, supporting each other. Supporting each other, we mentioned that already. We have a limited time. The service industry and the technology industry are the two main industries that are booming now. Apart from banking, right? The banks by itself is a whole nother story. 
and a whole different ball game to get into. Right? But service. What I mean by service, you have some old ladies down the road, they're having problems getting on their internet, they're having problems um, manipulating and maneuvering the technology. Help them. That's a service. It can also be a ministry. But you're looking for ways how you can give support at a cost. There was this guy, he, had, he cleans buildings for a living. And he said at the age of 27, he was frustrated. He was working and he was doing everything by himself. But at the end of the day, he was fatigued. He was tired. He was stressed because he was doing everything himself. He collapsed. When he wake up, his girlfriend left him. His mother was complaining, I don't see you again. Until he started to consult with some elders. And he started to look into himself and say, I'm doing something wrong. So he hired somebody to do it. And he followed the principle of McDonald's, the man that owned McDonald's. Where he will make a hundred percent of a hundred persons effort. He will rather make than a hundred percent of his own effort. So sometimes how we think and our mindset has got to change. Our we might need to upgrade what we learn, regardless of our accolades and our degrees because things are moving faster than we can imagine and it is time for us to strategically plan how we go forward because the church depends on it the church depends on it and I believe fasting and praying, seeking God, and many of us have been doing it, but we have to work together. We have to start supporting each other. We have to start being professional. We need the support of the ministers, the support of the pastors to start injecting these things in the assembly, injecting these things in the saints. Be professional. Support your own, but be professional, man. Not because he's your brother. You give him a receipt. Be diligent in business. God expects it of you. God expects it of you. Time is far spent, and we know we have a curfew. I'll pause here for now. I have some more that I put together, but maybe another time. God richly bless you. Praise the Lord. We try to cram a lot into the night. Uh, thank Minister McCarge for, for that. And we really do have a lot of time left. Really appreciate all of you coming out. I know this is different. As Sister Amen Renford said, normally you'd be on Zoom, but boots on the ground. We have to get back out, folks. We're going to ask Sister, Sister Pedler is going to come and close us, but we have to get back out. We have to get back out, and we have to hybrid and have a mixture of both Zoom and live. Amen. Is there one question before we close? Minister, Pastor Smith. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Um, I listened quite intently to the presentations that were given, and I thought they were very good, very insightful, very inspiring. Um, in terms of the online 
online ministry. Whereas I can understand how it can grow your church attendance. I, I'd like us to consider how it will grow our membership. Membership. Because how do you baptize somebody online? Um, the person is in China. You have ministered to them. But how do they become a member of the church without baptism? And can you baptize them online? Yes. I would have hoped, I would have hoped they received the Holy Ghost, but then Peter said, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized to complete the new birth experience? I was hoping that we would speak a little bit more about, more about networking. Networking or assemblies with others. Because that's another part of the the puzzle that needs to fit in. Yes. Because we need to know where to send people. Even if they're going to become a part of our online congregation, we still have to get them baptized by somebody who is baptized in Jesus' name and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So I'm wondering, uh, that's, that's my proposal for us. Yes. Um, we need a part two. Yes, Minister Nemard. Uh, yes, but, uh, Minister Nemard, yes. I have a candidate in Canada for some time. Oh, you have a candidate and in I Canada to be baptized. Pentecostal church near. So I was thinking to be on the safe side, I'll let him sit in his tub. <laughs> I'll call his name. And I'll say, upon the confession of your sins and the profession of your faith towards God, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go down in the tub now. Make sure you are fully covered. I am thinking of doing that because I don't know where to send him. And I don't know when he will be coming back to Jamaica. And it's been a while now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, it, if it's against the, the, the UPC protocol. But we have to think about All, all of you heard that? Praise the Lord. I just want you to hear. I'm saying, let's not close our mind. Let's explore in the months. COVID will be, will be with us for a, a little while to come, based on all the projection, maybe another year. What, what Minister Nemar did say, he would tell the man to lie down in the, sit down in the tub. Then him call him name and say, I know baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, and tell him to go under the water and make sure he completely cover himself. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, Minister Williams. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'd like to concur with um, what um, Pastor Smith said. Yes. That the presentations were very enlightening. Yes. Well thought out, well put together. One minute. The online church. Yes. No, um, I've seen many churches online. And, and what I've found out is um, that a lot of churches haven't spent enough time. Yes. To somehow have an altar service after beautiful presentation etc right so i'm kind of thinking that we need to, to to give some thought yes as to what we can do i know some churches after the presentation online they have a number that you're calling they have virtual altar yes, yes. Altar service right right etc so so that's one thing we want to focus on that altar service part because a lot of churches beautiful presentation but there's no no means by which and i was kind of thinking yes that what we probably could do is persons who are interested because we could have maybe um noon hour services in you know, a lunchtime you know right yes one hour deliverance services online where yeah. five minutes after 12 persons can look at it on their phones and you pray for the needs etc and also what i think we could do we could have maybe an online altar service right so all the persons you know want the holy ghost join this zoom meeting Yes. You know, or if you're a family member, invite them over. If you're a friend and you know their COVID status, invite them to your home. Right. And we have uh, give them instruction that you pray them through online, etc. So yes. I think we need to probably take it to a yes. different level. In in closing, um, one of our pastors told us it was I don't remember his name, but he's not a Jamaican. He's an, one of our international pastor. 
one of his members who worked on a ship, he prayed with his roommate and he got the Holy Ghost. But it's a brother who is quiet in the church. He doesn't even testify. And he said to him, you baptize him. But I said, but I don't even... He said, yes, you baptize him. So the pastor went on the phone with him and tell him what to do. And he baptized him in Jesus' name. And that's one of the concepts of the cell ministry is that every, in every cell, you should have a baptizer. Every cell, you have to diversify we have to decentralize the church to, to move forward. And the online ministry does work, as Brother Minister William is saying, and others. And Sister Renford, Brother Dwayne, maybe we need to have another look at it and take it deeper into all of these areas. How do we actually manage a congregation virtually like we manage a congregation, literally? Two, two weeks ago, we were having prayer meeting, and what we did... Before each section, we announce that the next session is intercession. So we want you to send in your intercessory message. And people begin to send in online their messages for intercession. We wrote down their, their names, take it to the person praying, pray for them. By the next session, another stream of name was coming in. So the next level for online is to have a proper communication and interacting system with the people out there. And that will skyrocket our, our online attendance. And to manage that, you're going to need another minister within the church and persons. Maybe you have to have a minister in the, in the media room, sitting with the media team to, to interact and communicate. So there's a lot of work, a lot of things to be said. Time has run out. We explore it in, in 2.0. Yes. Yes. Agree. Yes. At the upper level, agree. Position be taken. But there, there's precedence, you know. Remember, there's precedence. When they, as, not the Azusa Street, but if you read the history of the, the rebirth of the apostolic movement in the 19th century, the person who baptized one pastor who wasn't baptized in Jesus' name, he baptized his colleague in Jesus' name first, then his colleague baptized him. None of them were baptized. They had the Holy Ghost, but they were still Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So one baptized the other, and the other one baptized the other. That's how the apostolic church started. Remember at the start, there was nobody who was baptized in Jesus' name. They had the Holy Ghost. So one person baptized one, and the other one baptized the other one. And that is how the baptism starts. So if you have a couple online who have received the Holy Ghost, with that precedence, I believe the wife, the husband can baptize the wife, then the wife baptize the husband, and the church starts. It's not an issue. I'm saying, did Jesus, Jesus could not have baptized the disciple because he had not yet died. The question is, was it Jesus that baptized them after his resurrection? Do you know who baptized the first apostle? Who baptized the first apostle? Was it Jesus who baptized? Because he couldn't have baptized them before he died because it wouldn't have been effective because baptism represents his death. He had to die and be resurrected before baptism was initiated biblically. So who did the first baptism? Was it Jesus came back and started? Or did Peter baptize somebody and then the baptism start? I don't know. I'm just asking. Who did the first baptism? That's the question. But not in Jesus' name, because he could not baptize. That's a theological dilemma. He could not baptize in Jesus' name until he was dead and resurrected. He couldn't have baptized before his death, because baptism is symbolic of his death. Yes. Yes. Yeah, in Jesus' name. But not before Pentecost, they could not have baptized. Before the death, they could not baptize in Jesus' name. What's that? I don't. Ten seconds. Um, what I believe that this pandemic has done, 
This pandemic has changed a lot of things. I said it earlier, nobody knows that we'll be having Zoom in church. And with that in mind, a lot of things have to be put in place. Like, if you have a couple in China, they are not yet saved. And you can't go anywhere because you know their life can be risked. You have an online meeting with them and they, they, they want to be baptized. What will you do? What will happen? Who is the person to call? So, you know, we have to look at situations like that. And sometimes traditions and the way we think and our culture can affect a mighty revival and a mighty move. But sometimes we have to look at those things and a broader scope that we don't miss the opportunity where a soul can be saved and, 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 and revival can occur. So we have to look at it properly and then put in the right thing in place. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Let us stand. Praise God. My apologies, sir. Also for Pastor Pedlo is in West Milan. And also I've been asked to pray for one of our ministers, Brother Ricardo Carr, Minister Ricardo Carr from the Potter's House, who is not well. Um, so we need to lift him up in prayer. Let us pray. Praise God. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for what has been accomplished here tonight, Father. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you've been here with us, Lord Jesus, giving us ideas, turn our hearts. Mighty God, I pray, God, that you would journey home with us, mighty God. Protect us from all harm and danger. Cover our presbyter, Lord God. Hallelujah, under the blood, this family. Lord Jesus, all the leaders, all the pastors, oh God. Oh, mighty God, every mission director, every youth department, personal, every woman, president, all our leaders, God, help us to work in unity. Mighty God, hallelujah, do a great work in this region, mighty God, and throughout our churches, island-wide. Mighty God, I pray that you give us a burden, mighty God, to use every available means, hallelujah, to reach every person, mighty God, whether it's online or whether it's, oh God, face-to-face, -face, mighty God. Oh God, inspire our hearts, Jesus. Oh mighty God, help us to go and win the lost. Mighty God, that's what you died for. Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you, we adore you. Cover, Lord God, our bishop. Oh God, McCoy and his family under your blood. Remember all those who are sick, mighty God. Brother Ricardo Carr. Remember Sister Ellis, Lord Jesus. And oh God, some of our leaders, some of our pastor's wife. Remember Sister Spencer. Remember Pastor Milton Kelly. Oh God, hallelujah. Jesus, we love you tonight. We adore you. Bless our churches. Enlarge God, our territories. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for everything. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you we can, that we could meet face to face in this fashion. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you all for coming. God bless. And you came out. Remember the ministerial meeting on Thursday. The information is on your agenda. God bless you richly. We know this is new. Coming out like this, but... Boots on the ground. <laughs> Boots. And we are going to be exploring, exploring some of these issues. We're going to research them. We're going to put things together. And we're going to use all means possible to take this gospel near and far. Journey in mercy. Remember, we have some snack. You can get something, no matter how small, on the outside.